and the fade out fade out okay and turn off that's just the song that was in my head this morning So this morning we're going to go over respiratory system infections. Here we go. Everything looks good. All right. So aerosols produced by sneezing, coughing, or even just speaking are an important mechanism for respiratory pathogen transmission. Even covering your mouth while coughing or sneezing can reduce the spread of these microbes. Though now it's uh, sneezing, well, it has been for several years now, sneezing into your elbow instead of your hand. Now that's kind of like that dabbing thing, isn't it? All right. And the ranges, I think I talked about this before, you have um, about a three foot range, one meter for diseases transmitted by droplets, and about a six foot range or a couple of meters for those that can be transmitted by aerosol, by more fine particles. So the chapter outline, first we look at some of the basic anatomy and normal microbiota of the respiratory tract, then at some bacterial infections, then viral infections, then fungal infections. So anatomy and normal microbiota of the respiratory tract. So the, the, excuse me, the learning objectives include describing the major anatomical features of the upper and lower respiratory tracts, the normal microbiota of both, explain how microorganisms overcome defenses of upper and lower respiratory tract membranes to cause infection, explain how microbes and their respiratory system interact and modify each other in healthy individuals and during an infection. So clinical focus, part one, we have John. 65 year old man with asthma and type 2 diabetes who works as a sales associate at a local home improvement store recently he has begun to feel feel quite ill and made an appointment with his family physician at the clinic john reported experiencing headache chest pain coughing and shortness of breath over the past day he had also experienced some nausea and diarrhea a nurse took his temperature and found that he was running a fever of 104. So John suggested that he may have a case of influenza and regretted that he had put off getting his flu vaccine this year. After listening to John's breathing through a stethoscope, the physician ordered a chest radiograph, chest radiography, and collected blood, urine, and sputum samples. What factors may have contributed to John's illness? Oops, here we go. There. So here's the basic anatomy of the upper respiratory system. Oops, I need to go over here. There we are. And I am not going to walk through all of this. Just pointing out the main entry here, the nares and the nose into the nasal cavity. Uh, you have the nasolacrimal duct, so where the eye duct the drains into. So this is the duct through which people will shoot milk out of their eyes, which is a poor choice. Don't do that. So the back of the oral cavity you have the nasopharynx, the laryngeopharynx, pharynx, so vocal fold, so all these different parts. The epiglottis, it's a pretty important bit. Um, and of course the ears, we have the ear canal, our tympanic membrane that comprises the external ear. And then we have the middle ear, that is the tympanic cavity. 
and then we have a connection also to the pharynx to the nasopharynx specifically here we go opening of the eustachian tubes lower respiratory system we get down below uh, the larynx we have the bronchi the primary bronchi then we have secondary bronchus so we're branching into smaller and smaller areas then the tertiary bronchus terminating in the bronchole bronchole and the we have the alveolar sacs where the gas exchange takes place the individual alveolus so again we're beginning so the part we consider the lower respiratory system begins at the epiglottis Oh, that's interesting. Human lungs contain on the order of 400 million alveoli. Outer surface of the lung is protected with a double layered pleural membrane. This structure protects the lungs and provides lubrication to permit the lungs to move easily during respiration. So defenses of the respiratory system. We have the viscosity and the acidity of the secretions of the mucous membranes here. Uh, they inhibit the attachment of pathogens or would-be pathogens. In addition, the respiratory tract has the ciliated epithelial cells that uh, beat which will dislodge and propel mucus and any mu microbes trapped within the mucus upwards towards the epiglottis where they will be swallowed. This is the mucociliary escalator effect. Upper respiratory system is under constant surveillance by mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, malt for short, including the adenoids and tonsils. Other mucosal defenses include secreted antibodies, so this is IgA, lysozyme, surficant, and antimicrobial peptides cause defenses, which uh, all these things were mentioned in a previous chapter as well. And the lower respiratory tract is protected by alveolar macrophages. So the normal microbiota in the upper respiratory system, so we're talking nasal passages, sinuses, uh, members of firmicutes, actinobacteria, proteobacteria, including Staphylococcus epidermidis, naturally, viridens group, streptococci, Carinobacterium species, those are diphtheroids, Propionibacterium species, remember the a primary agent of acne, Hemiophilus species. Not they're not all influenza type B, right? Other members of Hemiophilus that are not pathogenic or are only opportunistic. So in the oropharynx, uh, we have the some of the same representatives of the. Uh, and then nasal sinus passages with these other genera, which can include candida fungal isolates, Morixella, that's used in cheese making, I think. I'm gonna look right quick. Morixella. Alright, 
well, I'm not going to be able to sort that out right now. Ink total. It is, it's around. Okay. So about 20% of everyone carries Staphylococcus aureus. Not necessarily the uh, resistant strains, not MRSA or VRSA, just Staphylococcus aureus. The pharynx can be colonized with path pathogenic strains of Streptococcus, Haemophilus, and Neisseria. Here are some important respiratory diseases and, oops, there we go, that's tuberculosis down there. So we have a vaccine for chickenpox. That's of course the varicella zoster virus. And we have nothing against the common cold, which is over 200 strains, I believe, of the rhinovirus. Diphtheria, we have DTAP, TDAP, DT, TD, DTP. So there's a lot of formulations here that we'll, I will talk about more in a few slides. And against epiglottitis and uh, ear infections by Haemophilus influenza, that's the Hib against the Haemophilus influenza type B. We have a couple of versions of influenza vaccine. I'm not sure of the status of flu mist right now. Okay, there's a story about it. University of Minnesota talking about bringing back the flu mist because that is the attenuated virus. All right. Of course, measles included in the MMR, pertussis, uh, DTAP, Tdap. It's one of the. This is the AP. Uh, a is for a cellular, a cellular pertussis. And pneumonia, we have a conjugate and a polysaccharide vaccine. Uh, rubella, part of the MMR. SARS, there is none. It's a coronavirus as the causative agent. And there is the BCG vaccine for mycobacterium tuberculosis, which I don't think uh, is commonly given to anyone at all unless you're going to be sent to an endemic area okay yeah so this is situational uh, healthcare workers obviously and then uh, children who have a negative tuberculin skin test who are continually exposed and cannot be separated from adults who have an untreated or ineffectively treated uh, TB disease or have TB caused by strain resistance are resistant to these treatments Pretty sure I don't have that one. Okay, so signs and symptoms. Here's our terminology of uh, respiratory infections. So when we say rhinitis, we're talking about inflammation of the nasal cavity, sinusitis, inflammation of the sinus, otitis, ear infection. Uh, pharyngitis, sore throat, laryngitis, so uh, inflammation of the larynx that generally renders you unable to speak. Tonsillitis, epiglottis, bronchitis, all infections of those respective anatomical features. Pneumonia is when the alveoli are infected or inflamed. Uh, you have pus and edema swelling filled with fluids. That's very dangerous. 
So also exists out there in, in the world is smoking associated pneumonia. In this little case a description, we have Camilla, 22 year old student who has been a smoker for five years. She's developed a persistent cough that has not responded to over the counter treatment. Her doctor ordered a chest radiograph to investigate. The radiological results were consistent with pneumonia. In addition, Streptococcus pneumonia was isolated from Camilla's sputum. So smokers are at greater risk of pneumonia than the general population. And some of the effects tobacco, tobacco smoke has include disrupting the function of the ciliated epithelial cells. So your muscociliary escalator is impaired, inhibiting phagocytosis, blocking the ac action of antimicrobial peptides. So the organisms trapped in the mucus are have an easier time colonizing and causing infection rather than being expelled or swallowed. I was a smoker for a lot of years. I quit two years ago. Well, I use, I still use the vaping device some, but not with diacetyl or anything. All right, section two, bacterial infections of the respiratory tract. So the learning objectives include uh, the ability to identify the most common bacteria that can cause infections of the upper and lower respiratory tract and to compare the major characteristics of specific bacterial diseases of the respiratory tract. Streptococcal infections. Oops, I'm on the wrong page again. There we go. Here is a colorized SEM of Streptococcus pyogenes showing the characteristic cellular phenotype resembling chains of cocci. And they've colored it a convenient crystal violet looking color too. So streptococcal pharyngitis strep throat is caused by streptococcus pyogenes. Rebecca Lancefield serologically classified streptococci in the 1930s using carbohydrate antigens from the bacterial cell wall. Strep pyogenes is the sole member of the Lancefield Group A streptococci and are often referred to as GAS or Group A strep. Direct contact droplet transmission happens. We can use uh, rapid enzyme immunoassay to identify it, though culturing and identifying from culture is still the gold standard for identification. That's going to be 16S ribosomal RNA analysis, I expect. So many strains of strep pyogenes can degrade the connected tissue using hyaluronidase, collagenase, and streptoc kinase. Streptokinase activates plasmin, causing the degradation of fibrin, dissolution of blood clots, which assists in the spread of the pathogen. Release toxins include streptolysins that can destroy red and white blood cells. The classic signs of streptococcal pharyngitis are a fever higher than 38 degrees Celsius, 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit and teen and intense pharyngeal pain, uh, redness associated with pharyngeal inflammation and swollen dark red palatine tonsils, often dotted with patches of pus and uh, petechia, so microcapillary hemorrhage on the soft or hard palate of the mouth. And that's what we have here. The submandibular lymph nodes beneath the angle of the jaw are often also swollen during strep throat. Some strains of group A streptococci produce urethrogenic toxin. 
and this toxin is encoded by a temperate bacteriophage is an example of phage conversion. So where the pathogen has acquired a capability uh, from a phage. The toxin attacks plasma membranes of uh, capillary endothelial cells and leads to scarlet fever. Disseminated fine red rash on the skin uh, and a strawberry tongue, red rash on the tongue. Severe cases may even lead to streptococcal streptotoxic shock syndrome, STSS, which results from massive superantigen production that leads to septic shock and death. Acute otitis media. So this is fairly common in uh, kids that are from three months to about three years old. It's the second leading cause of pediatrician visit for kids under five, uh, leading to antibiotic prescription. We have pus in the middle ear, bulging of tympanic membrane. So this is the middle ear infection, AOM. Inflammation and swelling of eustachian tubes, fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, ear tugging is one of the most obvious signs from kids that can't tell you what's wrong yet. So among neonates, uh, strep pneumonia is the most common cause, but uh, Escherichia coli, enterococcus, group B strep, can also be involved in older infants and children younger than 14 the most common bacterial causes are strep pneumonia hemiophilus influenza or morixella uh, caterhalis among strep pneumonia infections encapsulated strains are frequent causes of aom Rather than direct tissue damage by these pathogens, bacterial components such as LPS induce an, inf an inflammatory response that causes swelling, pus, and tissue damage within the middle ear. So that remember that was uh, endotoxin. Any blockage of the eustachian tubes with or without infection can cause fluid to become trapped and accumulate in the middle ear. This is referred to as otitis media with effusion, O-M-E. The accumulated fluid offers an excellent reservoir for microbial growth, and consequently, secondary bacterial infections often ensue. Children have more upper respiratory infections in general, and their eustachian tubes are also shorter and drain at a shallower angle. Young children also tend to spend more time lying down than adults, which facilitates drainage from the nasopharynx through the eustachian tubes and into the middle ear. Bottle feeding while lying down enhances this risk because the sucking, the sucking action on the bottle causes negative pressure to build up within the eustachian tube, promoting the movement of fluid and bacteria from the nasopharynx. Diphtheria. This is Carinobacterium diphtheria that causes it. It's a club shaped gram positive rod that belongs to the phylum uh, Actinobacteria. Diphtheroids are common nasopharyngeal microbiota. Some strains, however, become pathogenic. Because of the presence of a temperate bacteriophage encoded protein, the diphtheria toxin. Diphtheria is typically a respiratory infection of the oropharynx, but can also cause impetigo-like lesions on the skin. Although the disease can affect people of all ages, it tends to be most severe in those younger than 5 or older than 40 years. Commonly transmitted in the droplet and aerosols produced by coughing. Now, the diphtheria toxin is an AB type toxin. So remember you had one portion that was good at binding cells and the other portion was the toxic portion. 
So a pseudomembrane tends to form as pictured here. Uh, that's composed of dead cells, pus, red blood cells, fibrin, bacteria, tend to cover the nasal cavity, tonsils, pharynx, and larynx. Intubation sometimes required. Broad spectrum antibiotics are typically employed. So the vaccine we have, uh, so DTAP, so all the letters here are D is for diphtheria, T is for tetanus, P is for pertussis, and A is for acellular. Capital letter means it's a full strength dose. Uh, children should get five DTAP and then at minimum a TD booster every 10 years thereafter. But uh, TDAP is pretty typical there. I just had my booster, my last booster was like three years ago, three or four years ago now. So yeah, again, these are toxoid vaccines. Well, it's a single vaccine with all these components in it, right? So yeah, if you haven't had uh, Tdap and you don't know how long, it wouldn't hurt to get one. So bacterial pneumonia, uh, this is what they can appear like in an x-ray. So these are consolidations or lesions that are present as opaque patches. And remember, this is a little truncated here because of the heart. That's, yeah. So pneumonia is the general term for infections of the lungs that lead to inflammation and accumulation of fluids and white blood cells in the alveoli. It can be bacterial, viral, fungal, and other organisms, but it's mostly bacterial. It causes more than it caused more than 50,000 deaths in the United States in 2014. As the alveoli fill with fluids and white blood cells, uh, that's consolidation, air exchange becomes impaired and patients experience respiratory distress. Infection of the pleural membrane is called pleurisy. So, new, so um, I'm going to describe several different types of bacterial pneumonia that have some different characters, but they all share the fluid in the lungs and the consolidations. Now, the most common cause of community-acquired bacterial pneumonia is from uh, Streptococcus pneumonia. It is a normal microbiota of the human respiratory tract. Pneumococci initially colonize the broncholes, of the lungs, eventually the infection spread to the alveoli where the microbes polysaccharide capsule interferes with phagocytic clearance. Other virulence factors include uh, autolysins like LYTA, L-Y-T-A, which degrades the microbial cell wall resulting in cell lysis and the release of cytoplasmic virulence factors. One of these factors, pneumolysin O, is important in disease progression. This poor forming protein damages host cells, promotes bacterial adherence, and enhances pro-inflammatory cytokine production. The resulting inflammatory response causes the alveoli to fill with exudate rich in neutrophils and red blood cells. As a consequence, infected individuals develop a productive cough with bloody sputum. So that's pneumococcal pneumonia. Hemiophilus pneumonia. Uh, this is caused by encapsulated strains of Hemiophilus influenza that are also known for causing meningitis. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. Um, the encapsulated strains of Hemiophilus influenza are known for causing meningitis, whereas the non encapsulated strains are important causes of pneumonia. This is a small gram negative cocobacillus found in the pharynx of the majority of healthy children. However, Hemiophilus pneumonia is primarily seen in the elderly. Like other pathogens that cause pneumonia, H. influenza is spread by droplets and aerosols produced by coughing. A fastidious organism, 
Hemiophilus influenza will only grow on media with available factor X, hemin, and factor V, NAD, like uh, chocolate auger. Which is, yeah, okay, that's the auger pictured here. It's a lighter color than what I've seen before. Or maybe that was just me. So thanks to the vaccine, serious cases of Hib disease have dropped by more than 99% since 1991. This is a conjugate vaccine. So you, you take something that's immunogenic and um, attach what you hope uh, to develop memory and plasma cells against to that so that they also become antigenic. So then we have mycoplasma pneumonia. This is usually characterized as a walking pneumonia. And this is uh, primary atypical pneumonia. So mycoplasma pneumonia is not a normal part of the microbiota and can cause e epidemic disease outbreaks. So these infections are common in crowded environments like college campuses and military bases. It is spread by aerosols formed when coughing or sneezing. It is often mild with a lower fever, with a low fever and a persistent cough. These bacteria, which do not have cell walls, use a specialized attachment organelle to bind to ciliated cells. In the process, epithelial cells are damaged and the proper function of the cilia is hindered. And that's pictured here. So we also have chlamydial pneumonias and psittacosis. So chlamydophila pneumonia, so that's the new classification, uh, previously known as chlamydia pneumonia. And we have chlamydophila sitaki, sitaki, sitaki. That sounds kind of fun. We'll use that. And it's also caused by chlamydia trachomatis, of course. These are and continue to be obligate intercellular parasites. Uh, the psittacosis is a zoonotic disease affecting domestic birds like parakeets, ducks, turkeys. And trachomatis can cause pneumonia in infants, the chlamydia trachomatis. So these, uh, this is a mild to severe pneumonia and bronchitis. Diagnosis of chlamydia by culturing tends to be difficult and slow. Again, back to the obligate intracellular parasite. They require multiple passages through tissue culture uh, to grow enough to be able to detect it recently or reasonably. Recently, a variety of PCR and serologically based tests have been developed to enable easier identification of pathogens. Tetracycline and macrolide antibiotics are typically prescribed for treatment. We have healthcare associated pneumonia as well. This tends to be by Klebsiella pneumonia or Staphylococcus aureus and proteobacteria such as species of Escherichia, Proteus, and Serratia. And then there's Pseudomonas pneumonia. Uh, this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Cystic fibrosis patients are particularly vulnerable to it. So the, the, the healthcare associated pneumonia tends to be, uh, tends to occur in the elderly. And then uh, if, in, and in immunocompromised individuals, if it's by Klebsiella, it gets characterized by lung necrosis and what's termed current jelly sputum. That is frequently fatal even when treated. Part two, John's chest radiograph revealed an extensive consolidation in the right lung. Sputum culture revealed the presence of a gram negative rod. Physician prescribed a course of the antibiotic uh, clarithromycin he also ordered the rapid influenza test diagnostic test, R-I-D-T-S, or RIDS. 
for type A and B influenza to rule out a possible underlying viral infection. Despite antibiotic therapy, John's condition continued to deteriorate, so he was admitted to the hospital. Tuberculosis. Here is a cartoon of the infection cycle of tuberculosis. So the immune response of most infected individuals, about 90%, results in the formation of tubercles, tubercles in which the infection is walled off. So it's a type of granuloma. The sequestered bacteria may re be reactivated to form secondary tuberculosis in immunocompromised patients at a later time. So droplet nuclei containing tubercle bacteria is inhaled, enters the lungs, travels to the alveoli, and the tubercle multiply in the alveoli. And then here is the formation of the tubercle And then sometimes they get broken down, whoops, and uh, are free to rapidly multiply, forming more tubercles. Tuberculosis is one of the deadliest infectious diseases in human history. Although infection rates in the United States are extremely low, the CDC estimates that about one third of the world's population is infected with Mycobacterium tuberculosis the causal organism of TB, with 9.6 million new TB cases and 1.5 million deaths worldwide in 2014. So the um, little more detail, the bacteria, they'll enter the alveoli as pictured here. The cells are able to survive in macrophagocytes because of the protection afforded by their waxy mycolic acid. If not eliminated by macrophages, the infection can progress, causing an inflammatory response and an accumulation of neutrophils and macrophages in the area. Several weeks or months may pass before an immunological response is mounted by T cells and B cells. Eventually, the lesions in the alveoli become walled off, forming the tubercles. So bacteria continue to be released into the center of the tubercles, tubercles and the chronic immune response results in tissue damage and induction of apoptosis in a process called liquefaction. This creates a caseous center, an air pocket, where the aerobic mycobacterium tuberculosis can grow and multiply. Tubercles may eventually rupture and bacterial cells can invade pulmonary capillaries. From there, bacteria can spread through the bloodstream to other organs, a condition known as miliary tuberculosis. The rupture of tubercles also facilitates transmission of the bacteria to other individuals via droplet aerosols that exit the body and coughs. Because these droplets can be very small and stay aloft for a long time, Special precautions are necessary when caring for patients with TB, such as the use of face masks and negative pressure ventilation and filtering systems. And the vaccine, it's an attenuated live bacteria is what it's for. All right. So we have the Manito tuberculin skin test, which I think I mentioned before, but we'll go over again. This is regularly used in the US to screen for potential TB exposures, right in the chapter with uh, hypersensitivities. Prior vaccinations with BCG vaccine can cause false positive results. Chest radiographs to detect GON complexes um, formation are required, therefore, to confirm exposure. So again, this is the turbiculin is injected just under the skin there and then examined and measured uh, 48 to 72 hours later. Here's a summary of the bacterial infections of the respiratory tract. So we have what I did not mention was Legion Legionnaire's disease. This is Legionella pneumophila. Contaminated water reservoirs like air conditioning and fountains are good for 
uh, growth media for these things. Q fever. Let's see. In a, ooh, inhalation of aerosols of urine, feces, milk, or amniotic fluid of infected cattle, sheep, or goats. Okay, here's some more. And these are all things that I said things about already. That's fine. Okay, so now we're moving on to viral infections of the respiratory tract. Identify the most common viruses that can cause infections of the upper and lower respiratory tract. Compare major characteristics of specific viral diseases of the respiratory tract. So part three, clinical focus. Since antibiotic treatments have proven ineffective, John's doctor suspects that a viral or a fungal pathogen may be the culprit behind John's case of pneumonia. Another possibility is that John could have an antibiotic resistant bacterial infection that require a different antibiotic or combination of antibiotics to clear so the RIDT tests both came back negative for type A and type B influenza. However, the diagnostic laboratory identifies the sputum isolate as Legionella pneumophila. Doctor ordered tests of John's urine. And on the second day after his admission, the results of the enzyme immunoassay were positive for Legionella antigen. John's doctor added uh, levofloxacin to his antibiotic therapy and continued to monitor him. The doctor also began to ask John where he had been over the past 10 to 14 days. So viruses, the common cold, more than 200 different viruses. It's not just rhinoviruses, but also coronaviruses and adenoviruses. Now, there's a lot of times people will claim that they have the flu when they really have a cold. You can have a fever with the cold, but it's going to be lower than with influenza. Headaches are common in both. Mild aches and pain, slight fatigue, uh, nasal congestion and seizing are common with the common cold. But with influenza, congestion and seizing are rare. The fatigue and the aches and pains are severe. So the common cold uh, is considered a mild viral infection, uh, typically of the nasal cavity, and it is spread by direct contact or droplet transmission. Typically resolves in one to two weeks. Influenza, on the other hand, here's a cartoon of the influenza virus. We have the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase are the external spikes and let's see uh, surrounds the individual seven or eight RNA genome segments that are on the inside so it's a common viral disease of the lower respiratory system caused by an ortho mixovirus influenza is pervasive worldwide and causes 3,000 to 50,000 deaths each year in the U.S. Last year was higher at 80,000 deaths. Strains that affect young adults are believed to involve a cytokine storm, a complication of influenza that occurs primarily in children and teenagers is Ray syndrome. This sequela causes swelling in the liver and brain and may progress to neurological damage, coma, or death. Ray syndrome may follow other viral infections like chickenpox and has been associated with the use of aspirin. For this reason, or for this reason, the CDC and other agencies recommend that aspirin and products containing aspirin never be used to treat viral illnesses in children younger than age 19. Again, the RNA genome exists in seven or eight segments. Uh, each is coated with ribonucleoprotein and encoding one or two specific viral proteins. The influenza virus uses the hemagglutinin protein to bind to uh, sialic acid receptors on host res respiratory epithelial cells. This facilitates endocytosis of the viral particle. Once inside the host, the negative stranded uh, viral RNA is replicated by the viral RNA polymerase to form messenger RNA, which is translated by the host to produce viral proteins. 
Additional viral RNA molecules are transcribed to produce viral genomic RNA, which assemble within viron proteins to form mature virons. Release of the virons from the host is facilitated by viral neuraminidase, which cleaves uh, silic acid receptors to allow progeny viruses to make a clean exit when budding from an infected cell. Right, so it doesn't get stuck by the hemagglutinin on the way out. That's interesting. So three major groups. We have type A, B, and C. Uh, type A is severe while B is moderate and C is mild. Type A influenza does have animal reservoirs, has eight genomic segments. It uh, spreads through a population both by endemic and pandemic uh, degrees, I guess. And there is shift, antigenic shift and drift. B does not have an animal reservoir, can be an epidemic, and has antigenic drift. Okay, let's see. There are currently 18 known subtypes of hemagglutinin and 11 known subtypes of neuraminidase. Influenza viruses are serologically characterized by the type of H and N proteins they possess. Of the nearly 200 different combinations of H and N, only a few, such as H1N1, are associated with human disease. Influenza A virus can infect a variety of animals, including pigs, horses, and even whales and dolphins. Influenza B virus is less virulent and is sometimes associated with epidemic outbreak. Influenza C is generally produces the mildest disease symptoms and is rarely connected with ep epidemics. So here's some much more previous years, but the big epidemic, 20 million to 40 million deaths was the caused by H1N1. That was the Spanish flu. This should be an H, sorry. Uh, that's an error in the book that I missed. H2N2 was responsible for up to 2 million deaths in the late 50s. Hong Kong flu was H3N2, 3 million deaths. It's up to 1969. Swine flu, up to half a million deaths. H1N1 slash 09. So the influenza virus, uh, the infections, elicit a strong immune response, particularly to the hemagglutinin protein, which would protect the individual if they encountered the same virus. Unfortunately, the antigenic properties of the virus change relatively rapidly, so new strains are evolving that immune systems previously challenged by the influenza virus cannot recognize. When an influenza virus gains a new hemagglutinin or neuraminidase type, it is able to evade the host's immune response and be successfully transmitted, often leading to an epidemic. It is viruses produced by antigenic shift that have the potential to be extremely virulent because individuals previously infected by other strains are unlikely uh, to produce any protective immune response against these novel strains. Although referred to as the Spanish flu, this disease is thought to have originated in the United States. Regardless of its source, the conditions of World War I greatly contributed to the spread of this disease. Crowding, poor sanitation, and rapid mobilization of large numbers of personnel and animals facilitated the dissemination of the new virus once it appeared. So, flu view. This is the 2017-2018 season. We had... Here's positive for flu A, positive for flu B. This is a, uh, well, this is the weekly influenza surveillance report prepared for by the influenza division of the CDC. So, yeah, here we go. So this is 2017-2018. Again, um, last season we had 80,000 fatalities to influenza. But here are some of the types that we know some things about. H3 and 2 formed a bulk of the uh, reported cases.
and again uh, h3n2 was a major player and h1n1 was still here we go influenza a if we take this and this, this is the majority of all the cases now this should look um, familiar when we went over the mortality and morbidity reports this is mortality uh, specifically so we have an epidemic thresh threshold we expect a rise um, seasonally in winter and we had 2018 we had a huge spike uh, breaching the epidemic threshold number of influenza associated pediatric deaths by week of death um, we had the season here the last season that ended uh, topped a couple hundred by the end of it and at least in here probably true of these previous seasons but at least with this group 80% uh, of those that died did not get the flu vaccine 80% so these are our cumulative rates yeah so if you haven't gotten your flu vaccine please get it i mean of all the things out there that can kill you there's a lot of uh, potential tragic ends at least prevent the things that you can prevent right so viral pneumonia typically caused by respiratory syncytial viruses rsvs these are dangerous in infants highly contagious there are no specific therapies so sars and mers uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome middle east respiratory syndrome respectively these are caused by coronaviruses and are zoonotic so sars uh, bats and in civet cats and then mers in camels so we have measles rash causing viral respiratory diseases uh, rubiola this is the measles virus, uh, also known as Rhea. Yeah. This is a major cause of childhood mortality worldwide. Oh, I got a door. I got to pause this. Hold on. Okay, apparently one of our door alarms was going off continually. That's fine. Okay. Whew. I'm going to push through here. Or not. I don't know. Let me see. Not that much left. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and push through here. And then I gotta make up some questions for you <laughs> to answer. So the measles virus is a single-stranded negative strand RNA virus. And like the influenza virus, it possesses an envelope with spikes of embedded hemagglutinin. Infection spreads by direct contact. 
with infectious secretions or inhalation of airborne droplets spread by breathing, coughing, or sneezing. Measles is initially characterized by a high fever, conjunctivitis, and a sore throat. The virus then moves systematically through the bloodstream and causes a characteristic rash. The measles rash initially forms on the face and later spreads to the extremities. The red raised macular rash will eventually become confluent and can last for several days. At the same time, extremely high fevers, higher than 105 degrees Fahrenheit, can occur. Another diagnostic sign of measles infection is coplic spots white spots that form on the inner lining of inflamed cheek tissue, and that's what is pictured in B here. Okay, so it's one of the leading causes of death among young children, even though a safe and cost-effective vaccine is available. Measles vaccination resulted in an 84% drop in measles deaths between 2000 and 2016. In 2016, about 85% of the world's children received one dose of measles vaccine by their first birthday through routine health services, up from 72% in 2000. During the 2000 to 2016 period, measles vaccination prevented an estimated 20.4 million deaths by making measles vaccine one of the best buys in public health. In 2016, there were 89,780 measles deaths globally, marking the first year measles death had fallen below 100,000 per year. This is via the World Health Organization. So complications include um, with measles, it can lead to pneumonia, encephalitis, and death. In addition, the inhibition of immune system cells by measles virons predisposes patients to secondary infections. In severe infections with highly virulent strains, measles fatality rates can be as high as 10 to 15 percent. So in December 2014 is when we had the Disneyland uh, measles epidemic. Uh, within just four months, this outbreak affected 134 people in 24 states. The disease was, well, this measles virus was brought to the U.S. from the Philippines, most likely, where a similar virus had sickened more than 58,000 people and killed 110. Measles is highly communicable. The spread at Disneyland may have been facilitated by the low vaccination rate in some communities in California. Several factors could conceivably lead to a strong comeback of measles in the U.S., uh, it's still an epidemic disease in many locations worldwide. And we have some current outbreaks, actually, right now. I forgot where. Current measles outbreaks. As of November 3rd, 220 individual cases of measles have been confirmed in 26 states and the District of Columbia. So 2014, that would include the Disney outbreak as well. 2018, we're at 220. So we're getting on up there. 15 outbreaks so far. Oh wait, uh, let's see. Low vaccination rates in some local areas in the US, such as in Amish communities, but don't think that the Amish don't get vaccines entirely, but they do tend to be under vaccinated somewhat. Yeah. So rubella, which is German measles. This is an enveloped RNA virus. It can be found in the respiratory tract. Transmitted from person to person in aerosols produced by coughing or sneezing. Nearly half of all infected people remain asymptomatic. However, the virus is shed and spread by, by asymptomatic carriers. Like rubiola, rubella begins with a facial rash that spreads to the extremities. However, the rash is less intense, shorter lived, not associated with conflict spots, and the resulting fever is lower. 
Congenital rubella syndrome is the most severe clinical complication of the German measles. This occurs if a woman is infected with rubella during pregnancy. The rubella virus is um, teratogenic, meaning it can cause developmental defects if it crosses the placenta during pregnancy. There is a very high incidence of stillbirth, spontaneous abortion, or congenital birth defects if the mother is infected before 11 weeks of pregnancy. And 35% chance if she's infected between weeks 13 to 16. After this time, the incidence is low. Chickenpox. Varicella zoster virus, member of the herpes family or herpes virus family. In children, the disease is mild and self-limiting. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, mild, I guess, because you're not hospitalized, but it was pretty freaking miserable. It is easily transmitted by con direct contact or inhalation of materials from the skin lesions. In adults, chickenpox infections can be much more severe and can lead to pneumonia and birth defects in the case of infected pregnant women. Ray syndrome is possible. After the initial viral exposure, chickenpox has an incubation time of about two weeks. The initial infection of the respiratory tract leads to viremia, it eventually produces fever and chills. A pustular rash then develops on the face, progresses to the trunk, and then the extremities, although most form on the trunk. Eventually, the lesions burst and form a crusty scab. Individuals with chickenpox are infectious for about two days before the outbreak of the rash, until all of the lesions have scabbed over. Okay, this is uh, humans herpes virus three. It's the varicella zoster. Did I have? Oh no, this is just an individual suffering from shingles. Eesh. All right, so a summary of viral infections of the respiratory tract. These are all things that were talked about. And the table is in your book. All right, respiratory mycoses. Most common fungi that can cause infection of the respiratory tract. Compare the major characteristics of specific fungal diseases of the respiratory tract. I showed you this before. Uh, this is histoplasmosis. This is a fungal disease of the respiratory system and is most commonly uh, and most commonly occurs in the Mississippi Valley of the United States and in parts of Central and South America, Africa, Asia, Australia. Causative agent is Histoplasma capsulatum. It is a dimorphic fungus. Uh, this microbe grows as a filamentous mold in the environment, but occurs as a budding yeast during human infections. That's the dimorphic nature, either filament or yeast-like, which just means like balls. Instead of filaments. A primary reservoir for this pathogen is the soil, particularly in locations rich in bat or bird feces. Histoplasmosis is acquired by inhaling microconidial uh, spores in the air. These is not transmitted from human to human. The incidence of histoplasmosis exposure is high in endemic areas with 60 to 90 percent of the population having anti-histoplasma antibodies depending on the location you'll note where we're at here including here where i'm at right now this is all highly endemic area so it's reasonable to expect that most of you that are in the class uh, have been exposed already Okay, so let's see. Following inhalation, the spores enter the lungs and are uh, phagocytized by alveolar macrophages. The fungal cells then survive and multiply within the phagocytes. Focal infections cause the formation of granulomatous lesions, which can lead to calcifications that resemble the gone complexes of tuberculosis, even in asymptomatic cases. Crude mortality rate is approximately 5% for children and 8% for adult, for adults. Another uh, respiratory disease caused by a fungi is cocodiodomycosis. 
Cochidio do Cochidio do mycosis. Cochidio do mycosis. That sounds like it's with intent. So this fungus, um, oh yeah, Cochidioides or Cochidioides imitus causes this disease. Uh, the microbe is endemic to the San Joaquin. Joaquin. God damn it. Sorry. Valley of California. This is, disease is sometimes referred to as valley fever. Acquired by inhaling fungal spores. In this case, the arthrospores formed by hyphal fragmentation. Once in the body, the fungus differentiates into spherules that are filled with endospores. Uh, most of these infections are asymptomatic and self-limiting. However, the infection can be very serious for immunocompromised patients. The endospores may be transported in the blood, disseminating the infection and leading to the, form, to the formation of granulom granulomatous lesions on the face and nose, which is what's pictured here. This is not the typical expression of this disease. Resolution. John's negative RIDT tests do not rule out influenza since false negative results are common, but Legionella infection still must be treated with antibiotic therapy and is the more serious condition. John's prognosis is good, provided the physician can find an antibiotic therapy to which the infection responds. While undergoing treatment, three of the employees from the home improvement store also reported to the clinic with very similar symptoms. All three were older than 55 and had Legionella antigen in their urine. Legionella pneumophila was also isolated from their sputum. A team from the health department was sent to the home improvement store to identify a probable source for these infections. Their investigation revealed that about three weeks earlier, the store's air conditioning system, which was located where the employees ate lunch, had uh, been undergoing maintenance. The Legionella was isolated from the cooling coils in the, of the air conditioning system and intracellular Legionella pneumophila was observed in an amoeba in samples of the condensed water from the cooling coils. This picture here, Legionella inside the amoeba. So the store ordered a comprehensive cleaning of the AC system, implemented a regular maintenance program to prevent the growth of biofilms within the cooling tower, also reviewed practices at their other facilities. After a month of rest, John recovered from his infection enough to return to work as did the other three employees of the store. However, John experienced lethargy and joint pain for more than a year after his treatment. Oh, that sucks. Blastomycosis. This is a rare disease caused by another dimorphic fungus, uh, Blastomyces dermatitidis, like histoplasma and uh, cochidoides. Blastomyces uses the soil as a reservoir and fungal spores can be inhaled from disturbed soils. The pulmonary form of blastomycosis generally causes mild flu-like symptoms and is self-limiting. It can, however, become disseminated in immunocompromised people leading to chronic cutaneous disease with subcutaneous lesions on the face and hands. That's really impressive, subcutaneous lesions. Aspergillosis. The symptoms uh, commonly include shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, runny nose, and headaches. Fungal balls or aspergilloma can form when hyphal colonies collect in the lungs. The fungal hyphae can invade the host tissue, leading to pulmonary hemorrhage and a bloody cough. In severe cases, the disease may progress to a disseminated form that is often fatal. Death is most often results from pneumonia or brain hemorrhages. Pneumocystis pneumonia. This is caused by pneumocystis gyrovecchi. Once thought to be a protozoan, this organism was formerly named uh, pneumocystis carini, but has been reclassified as a fungus and renamed based on biochemical and genetic analyses. Pneumocystis is a leading cause of pneumonia in patients with AIDS and can be seen in other compromised patients and premature infants. Respiratory infection leads to fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Diagnosis of the infection can be difficult. The organism is typically identified by microscopic examination of tissue. 
We have cryptococosis. That's an encapsulated yeast. Uh, is ubiquitous in the soil and can be isolated from bird feces. Immunocompromised people are infected by inhaling basidiospores found in aerosols. The thick polysaccharide capsule surrounding these microbes enables them to avoid clearance by the patients. Pulmonary infections often disseminate to the brain. The resulting meningitis produces headaches, sensitivity to light, and confusion. Left untreated, such infections are often fatal. And there's a summary of these things. Uh, yeah. All right, that's it. Uh, see y'all when? Mon no, not this week because of Thanksgiving. Uh, I guess next Wednesday. I'm going to make, uh, I need to give you some homework from the previous chapter and this chapter. And that'll probably be it for what would be included on the final. But I'm still going to go through the rest of the disease chapters. All right. So have a good rest of your day. Uh, bye. Oh, wait. Let's do this. And then, okay.